you guys can stand with me. We're going to read Galatians chapter 6. And as you're standing and finding Galatians chapter 6, whether it's through a, a device that you have or a good old-fashioned hard copy of God's Word, I want to reiterate what Chris said a few minutes ago and that next weekend, Easter, is one of the two days each year that we leverage resources to create an environment so that the church, the local church of Crossings Community Church, all gathers together and enjoys one another. We have small groups that, that meet all the time in different pockets of men and women that do this and that, but it's really twice a year, Easter and what we call Legacy Sunday, that we all get together out there, we enjoy one another, and it's an environment where new people can begin to connect relationally. So I just want to encourage you, invite you to prioritize that, be here, bring somebody with you, look forward to being the church as we celebrate uh, the resurrection uh, next weekend. So with that, we're in Galatians chapter 6, big news, we will be finishing chapter 6 in three weeks, which means the end of Galatians. I've loved the journey of this book, but I know some of you just love the sense of completion as well, so it's coming. Let's look, Galatians chapter 6, I'm reading just five verses this morning, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes and he says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something... When he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. You guys can have a seat. I'm sure all of you in this room have heard the phrase, there's no I in team. Although, the Apostle Paul probably had never heard that phrase, I assume. I don't know when that uh, phrase was invented or said for the first time. But uh, in a sense, when you read these verses, what we just read, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 through 5, Paul's main idea is there's no I in church either. He's, he's wanting the Galatians and he's wanting all of us to begin to think about the church as a communal need, as God's gift to us to experience him and grow in this grand journey of transformation as the church instead of as individuals. I, I spent a significant amount of time this weekend at George R. Brown Convention Center my oldest is playing volleyball, big tournament there, and uh, it's a sight to see if you've never experienced it, which I know most of you in here haven't, but the George R. Brown Convention Center filled with volleyball teams playing volleyball matches, and for somebody like me who hates crowds and hates loud, unorganized noise, you get there and there are, think of how many referee whistles are blowing at once. I mean, they're filling the George R. Brown. I have no idea how these players know whether that referee is blowing a whistle for their game or the one right next to us. It's quite an experience. But uh, so uh, an average stay at a tournament like this is anywhere between five to eight hours. And so I was there on Friday for the first day of this tournament, and I took Bethany and uh, we're there. And it's an, uh, I watch a lot of volleyball. Okay, so this isn't the first time I've done this. We've been doing this for years and years. Uh, it's been her love sport uh, for uh, forever. It's been really the only sport she's loved. And so we've been playing for a long time, and I've been doing this thing, tournament thing, for a long time. So I've watched a lot of teams play. And when you go to these tournaments, there are all these teams surrounding you. And so my daughter may play a match, but then they have a break for one hour or two hours, or, or they have the responsibility of refing for another game. So I'm watching other teams play. Uh, and I love to watch volleyball, and so I'm sitting there and I'm watching, and it's an amazing study in team dynamics. You see a lot of things there. You see some teams there who look like they could all be college-level athletes. I mean, they're there, and they could be one of these great uh, college NCAA teams. I mean, they're amazing. Every player on the team is amazing. And you just know if you ask, yep, she's committed to this college, she's committed to this one. And then there are other teams where... Literally every single player on the team is horrible. And you watch those teams and you can't help but cringe and your heart breaks, you know, for, for those teams where all of the players, for whatever reason, maybe it's lack of experience, but when you watch 
any other team and this one, you don't have to know a thing about volleyball to know this team is not any good. And then there's other teams that are a mix of the two. They've got some, some good players and some not so good players. And then you've got the team that happens, I'd say fairly often, and that is you've got a team of one great player and then you have uh, that player surrounded by poor other players. And that's an interesting dynamic to watch because volleyball is different than many other sports. And here's the reason I think this is. Every single possession in the game of volleyball, someone gets a point. Okay, that's different than other sports, right? You can go an entire soccer game of 90 minutes and no one scores. That blows my wife's mind anytime that happens. Baseball, I mean, you can go a very long time without anybody scoring. In volleyball, every single possession, someone's going to score. And so what you see on these teams where there's one great player and the rest are poor is that that does not translate into a winning team. That one player can have a mind-blowing performance, the greatest performance of their life, an errorless performance, but that's not going to translate to advancing in these tournaments. Because they can't win alone. They can't win alone. And I think as we look at the New Testament, you don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to know how to read all the biblical languages. You don't have to, be, have to memorize the books of the Bible to see that God created us the same way. That he created us in such a way that we can't win alone. No matter how great or how hard we try, you see, if Christianity was an individual sport, then the New Testament that we we read and that we study, it would look a little bit more like these letters that would say, to the disciple of Bartholomew, or to the disciple Zebedee, or to the disciple so-and-so. But when you think about our New Testament, what is it? You have books that are named by the author that wrote them, right? And those are typically like the Gospels, historical narrative. And then you have a few that are written to individuals. I'm thinking like Timothy, right, and Titus. But these are books that are instructing those individuals how to lead a community. And then the others, Galatians, Ephesians, both the letters to the church in Corinth, they're written to churches, to communities. Because life as a Christ follower is experienced in community. And we see that throughout our throughout our Bibles and throughout not only the big picture, 30,000 feet, but, but as well as the details, the church is God's plan of salvation. We see that. The church is God's plan for salvation, not any super Christians. We've read all five verses, this in Galatians chapter 6, 1 through 5, but we're going to approach them out of order this morning. And the reason that I'm going to do that is the main idea of these verses is actually verse 2. So we're going to start there. And we see this phrase, which is, you could say, the ground of Paul's argument. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's what all of these verses here can be summed up as. And he's going to explain the how to do that. But bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, Eugene Peterson paraphrases it saying this. Reach out to those who are oppressed, share their burdens, and so complete Christ's law bear one another burdens as to fulfill the law of Christ. I'll never forget this moment, and neither will my brother, but I was a, about a sophomore in high school, around 16 years old, and I was over at a girl's house uh, swimming, and I had happened to take my brother and my cousin with me. I don't remember why. I checked the story with my brother this week to make sure that I had the details right, because I, it, it's a pet peeve of mine to to be one of those pastors who makes up stories to fit his illustration. So I try really hard not to do that. So I was talking to my brother, hey, this is what happened, right? Is this, yes, why? And neither one of us could remember why I had them two at that house that day. But my brother would have been about six years old. He's quite a bit younger than I am. And so they're out there, my brother and my cousin, and they're playing in the pool. And some moment of panic happens, and my cousin goes underwater, and he pulls, in order to pull himself up, he pulls my brother down. Well, my brother couldn't swim, and honestly, still today, he's not much of a swimmer. And uh, so at that moment, you have each one of these two young kids pulling on each other, pulling down, trying to get up. Well, you can imagine what the result of that is. Both of them were sinking. And so I see what's happening, and I had to make a preferential choice right at that moment of which one that I'm going to grab. And I always go with blood first. Uh, in those circumstances. So I see what's happening and I dive into the water and I grab my brother 
and I get him, I swim him up to the top and I get him out of the water and I get him over to safety. And my cousin was a little bit older than him and he was, had the ability then when the two were separated to get himself um, out at that point. But uh, no matter how hard my brother would have tried, he would have been incapable of getting himself out of that situation. He would have been completely, he was completely incapable of restoring himself to safety. In a sense, when you think about that, that's the story of salvation, isn't it? And that's the salvation story. You, you and I, as we read the, the, the Old Testament, we read about this, this group of people that, that God, he delivers a law, right? He delivers these instructions through Moses, instructions on how they're supposed to live. And we see this cycle that happens over and over and over again of them saying and thinking and attempting, I'm going to obey the instructions and then they fail. Okay, this time I think we can do it. They're gonna try to obey the instructions of, but they fail again. They had the complete inability to obey those instructions. And then what we see when we look at the New Testament, Paul in Romans chapter 7 shows us really what the reason of those instructions were. He says they weren't given with the expectation that they could truly be godly people as they obeyed those. The reason that those instructions were given was to reveal to them their sinfulness. It was to reveal to them their inability on their own to be godly people. It's a story that we have running throughout our Bible, and, and, and it's the story of the gospel. When you think back, and we'll look at this passage in a minute of, Rome, of Philippians, I'm sorry, chapter 2, but see this picture of God diving into the wickedness of the world in order to restore and to rescue a people with the inability of restoring themselves. That's you and I. He lifted us out. He's restoring our despair with hope, restoring our, our death, dead in our trespasses and sin, right, with life. And this is the model from which the church is birthed. And so as we look at Paul's main idea, he says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We are little Christians. We are the ones to live as Christ lived, little Christ. And so in the same way that Christ came, taking on the sin burden of his people, restoring them, he's saying, you do the same, church. Bear one another's burdens the way that Christ bore yours. That's a lofty challenge He's teaching the local church in Galatia how to, how to walk in their freedom as the church. As we look, if you look back up in verse 1, so to start from the top there, you see these words, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. We know Paul's writing to the local church, right? We've said that. We've said that over and over in this study of the book of Galatians. We know it from the title of Galatians, right? Who has he addressed this to? The saints or the holy ones gathered in Galatia. But Paul wants to add a double emphasis to that idea for us here. He says, not only do we know that, you're a people of faith, the audience that he's writing to, but he emphasizes it by saying, you who are spiritual. Well, he's saying the same thing. It's redundant, right? You can't be a believer in Jesus who placed your faith in Christ and not be one who is spiritual because we know from Ephesians and other places throughout our scriptures that the moment we place our faith in Jesus and we realize our inability to have a relationship with God, that sin gap is there. We need Jesus, and by faith alone, we're rescued or restored into a right relationship with him. We are indwelt with the Spirit. We're given the Holy Spirit. We are sealed with the Spirit. Therefore, we are spiritual. And so Paul wants to add that double emphasis here. Yes, I'm writing to you, local church, and you who are spiritual. So if you're asking this morning as we read these words, reads like words like, bear one another's burden, or words like, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. If you're asking, is that me? The answer is yes. If you're asking, is he talking to me? 
Is what Paul's saying, does it have, it's the application to me in my life? Yes, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, that's a responsibility that we are gifted to bear as the local church. In other words, he's saying local gathering of people who have placed your faith in Jesus, you, you should be making things right restoring that's what that word means you should be making things right or restoring those around you caught in sin and doing so with a spirit of gentleness this idea of restoration shows up another place in the new testament in matthew chapter 4 matthew uses this word to describe a moment where the disciples are sitting there and they've been fishing and there's a hole in their net And he says that they gather together mending that net. It's the same word, restoring, the restoring the net. I see that play out in my mind, and I see a scene that goes something like them fishing and and going out there, and they're, they're throwing a net out, and they're coming back, and they can maybe even see the fish, and, and maybe they're at their little honey hole. I don't know if the disciples had a honey hole, but maybe they're there in their spot, and it's like, the fish are here. I see the fish. This is always where we catch the fish, and they throw the net out there, and yet it's, it, they're incapable of catching the fish. They can't do it because there's a hole in their net. And so there they are gathered together there. In order for us to catch the fish, in order for us to accomplish the objective, we have to to sit down here and restore. We have to fix this net. They had the inability to catch fish until the net was restored. And I think what happens in our minds, specifically in the 21st century American church, is we like to, we like to, subdivide and compartmentalize the sin in our life and we we might like to think something like well i can i can have this little area of sin in my life and i can take it and i can hide it and i can push it to the side and it can then affect no one else around me if no one knows it's okay no harm no foul i had to put my daughter's car in the shop last week and it just wouldn't start of course being an ignorant ignorant car guy i love i wish i was a car guy but i'm just not um I've, i'm thinking oh alternator start or battery something like that well we have it towed uh, over to the shop and they say ac compressor and again not a car guy but i'm like what in the world does an ac component have to do with a car not start and of course, he educated me. It's all connected. The belt's here. If this one's not turning in this, it doesn't turn this there. It's all connected. Something that seems so unrelated doesn't allow the machine to function appropriately. And the same thing works in our lives and in our sin. There's not a sin that as a church community, we can say, I'm going to tuck it so far over here in this corner. And if nobody finds out about it, it's not going to affect anybody else. But the truth is the spiritual machine of the local church is then stalled out because of that thing that we buy the live Satan saying it's unrelated, but the fact it is, it, it is so related and intertwined to the spiritual vitality of his bride, the local church. And so Paul is challenging them. Paul is challenging them. When we're caught up in sin, our entire spiritual machine as individuals, and as the local church, it doesn't start. And so, therefore, spiritual restoration requires relationships. Spiritual restoration, it requires relationships. If we're trying to work through the process of restoration and isolation, we're no different than those fishermen throwing out a net with a big hole in it. We're not getting anywhere. We're not accomplishing anything. Because God didn't create us in such a way that we work through our own restoration process by ourselves. He created us in such a way that we need one another in the local church in order to walk that journey of spiritual restoration. Spiritual restoration requires relationship. And so what Paul does here in these verses is he, he speaks to all the parties involved. All of those involves both explicitly and implicitly. He said, we as a people of faith, that's us, the local church, those who have placed their faith in Jesus, are both the ones who need to embrace communal restoration in our own lives, as well as those who are needed in the lives of others. And so when we get to verse 3, Paul says, for 
if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Aren't those powerful words? For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. In other words, since you all struggle with pride, humble yourselves. Since every one of us as humans, we struggle with pride, humble yourself. Maybe another way to think about it is if any of you in here are golfers, I know there's probably some, and you reach that point in your journey, maybe it's a bad week, it's a bad month, or you've just reached that point in your golfing trajectory, if there is such a thing, and you, uh, you just get frustrated. You're so frustrated. I can guarantee you encouragement. And it's as simple as this. Play 18 holes with me. You will feel so much better about your game. You will feel so much better about where you are in your journey. You will realize how much you've learned and how great a golfer you are. It's the truth. But that's what Paul's talking about here. That's what he's warning against because there were people in the church who said, hey, look at me, this guy, we need to help him. We need to lift that burden. But aren't I special because I don't struggle with that sin? All the while forgetting the sin of the, the weight of the sin on their own lives. And so Paul's saying, no, in all humility, not only do you as the church need to be one, be the one who's bearing one another's burdens, but you need them as well. You're no different. You struggle with sin just like everyone else around you. I've said this many times in the life of our church, and I will say it many more times. We have this culture where at the, at the end of our worship time, oftentimes, I will encourage people to respond who need prayer, whether that's, uh, you don't have to come up. There's nothing magic about the way I pray or a prayer leader, whether you come up front or you go maybe to a small group leader or another even friend in the room, but you respond. But we've got this underlying mentality that if I get up and I walk to the front and, and, and people see me, they're going to think that, 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 that I'm this horrible person. They're going to think that my marriage is falling apart or that I'm addicted to drugs and alcohol or they're going to think all of this about me. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. I worry the most about those that never respond because every single one of us are wicked sinners. We should be the most broken about the people who never move and never respond and never embrace the gift of the bride of Christ in which we've been called to, to not only bear one another's burdens, but to have those around us love us enough in the spirit of gentleness to bear our burdens as well. He's created us in such a way that we, that we need it. You may not be struggling with the false intimacy of pornography, but, but your jealousy and covetousness is no better. You may not be struggling with godly financial stewardship as someone else around you in your group life, but your own struggle of malicious words to your spouse, it's no better. Paul is saying, humble yourself. Every single one of us are in need of the burden-lifting community called the bride of Christ. Every one of us may, must face the reality of our own sinfulness. So spiritual restoration requires relationships, but second, spiritual restoration requires humility. Spiritual restoration requires humility. This really brings us back to that central verse in verse 2, that main idea of Paul's, doesn't it? It brings us back to Christ. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, remember how Christ fulfilled the law. Remember the cross. I'll read to you Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Again, this is written to a local community, that church in Philippi, started by Lydia, a female working with purple linen meeting under the tree somewhere. Picture that local gathering of believers. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself. Remember, have this mind among yourselves. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
our model of restoration in the local church is the ultimate picture of humility, and that's Jesus himself. Our model for restoration, where do we look to? How do we do this? We look to Jesus and we see the humility of of the greatest one who was at the highest of highs who then emptied himself to come down to the lowest of lows and die the worst death imaginable, the most humiliating death throughout history that one could ever imagine, the excruciating death on a cross. And he did that to carry the burdens of the church. And Paul says, there's your model. We have to have the humility to embrace the humility to embrace the reality that we need one another. But also the humility to love one another one another enough in this journey of restoration with a gentle spirit. Spiritual restoration requires relationships and spiritual restoration requires humility. This week I, I asked my daughter before I shared this with you this morning, and and she gave me the nod. Um, This particular week was a difficult parenting week for us. We dealt with a situation that we've dealt with before uh, with our oldest, and it was a conversation we've come back to, and it was one that um, all of us in this room have difficult parenting weeks. For some of you, it looks like uh, my little one won't sleep all night. I'm exhausted all day. That can be a tough week. Others of you, you feel like they're going to think their name is no because that's the word that comes out of your mouth more than any other word is no, 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 no. That, that's a difficult parenting week, but they change in different seasons of life. And our parenting uh, struggle this week, it wasn't like that. It was a bit more complicated than those are, uh, and not to minimize those struggles at all. But um, So we're in this conversation, and Friday we reached a point where it was quite... Um, tense and heavy and emotional and it just so happens that I was the one that needed to take her down to that volleyball tournament on Friday and it was just me because this was early on Friday and uh, Lori of course teaches and she was at work and the others were in school and all that kind of stuff and so I was able to adjust my schedule where I could take her and there was a part of me that uh, kind of dreaded a bit of that because things were so tense and heavy I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to handle the situation. I was so overwhelmed with emotion that I was a bit paralyzed. And and that's saying a lot for me. Uh, We, so we get in the car and we're driving down to George R. Brown and um, uh, still the conversation is sparse and yet very heavy. And we get down there and in God's great sovereignty, we we pull into the parking garage that's across the street from the George R. Brown. It's dark, it's quiet, and we arrive 30 minutes before she needs to have her feet on the court. We've got 30 minutes we're setting, quiet, not driving, isolated in this um, parking garage there at the bottom. And as the conversation continues to heighten, um, heavy with tears, she had apologized many times and expressed regret. But she came to a point in the conversation where she said, I just don't know what to do. I need help. That for me was the breakthrough moment. That was the breakthrough moment because, you see, the regret didn't give me any hope. The I'm sorry didn't give me any hope because we can regret bad choices and then walk right back into them over and over again. Again, right? That's the Old Testament. We can regret and we can apologize all day. But until we come to a place of humility where we say, I just don't know what to do. I need help. That's when the journey of spiritual restoration really begins. That's the moment where the, this, this journey of spiritual restoration really begins because we say we're, we're no longer buying the lie of Satan of, okay, I messed up, now I'm just going to try harder so that I can not mess up again. And that's how the conversation had, had gone until we reached that moment where she said those words of, I don't know what to do, I need help. Friends, if we could conquer sin restoration and sin eradication on our own, well, then we would not need the cross of Christ. He would not have been needed to come and die and then rise again like he did, but he did need to come. He came and he lived and he died and he rose again three days later because we can't do it alone. 
we need help. So my question for you this morning is have you come to the place of humility to say, I need others to bear this burden with me? I need the church. I need the church to carry this weight with me. As you bow your head and close your eyes, and we begin to pray and respond, as we do each week, we've got these communion tables open, and if you've placed your faith in Jesus, as we talked about this morning, if you're one of those who are spiritual, you, you are a person of faith, then, then you're welcome at these tables coming and taking the bread representing Christ's body broken for you, dipping it in the cup representing his blood that was shed for you. But before you go there, before you hop up, will you wrestle with that question? Have you come to a place of humility where you recognize your desperate need for God's restoring gift called the church? Father, Father, I pray that amidst a spirit of conviction, there is an overwhelming sense of grace in the room this morning. Father, I, I pray against the spirit of fear that often overwhelms often enlarges the pride within us that says if, if I reach for help, if I say I can't do it alone, I'm some kind of a lesser person. Father, would you remove those lies from our mind and our heart forever? Father, might we be so in tune with your heart and your desire for us, your heart for your church, this morning that nothing, nothing and no one can get in the way of us responding to you and who you are. Us saying we need help. We can't do it alone. And Father, I, I, I just pray for courage this morning. Courage to respond, courage to say those words to a spouse if that's who needs to hear them. Father, courage to be able to tell a spouse I don't know what to do, I need help. Father, courage to be able to grab somebody else in a small group and say, I, I don't know what to do anymore, I need help. Father, courage to be able to respond, maybe to a prayer leader or a staff or an elder, I don't know what to do anymore, I need help. And Father, that we would stand confidently upon the promises of your word that, that your church in the spirit of gentleness and humility will be your gracious empowering restoration in our life. Father, we need you. Have your way with us this morning.